Uh, I got bad. Everyone? Okay, this is Raga Bell, uh, VP of uh, Thank you. VP of Bessemer Venture Partners. Uh, DVP, if you have heard of them, uh, they are one of the prominent VCs in India. Uh, with their investments with Taxi for sure, which has led a big uh, multi X bagger, multi bagger. And uh, he's part of uh, the uh, he was part of the board and also part of Ola Caps now. Uh, in terms of the, I, I think you hold a board position with them now. Apart from that, they have had uh, a lot of other investments like Big Basket, Swiggy. Uh, Matrimony, Private Limited, uh, right? So, Raghav has about six years experience in the VC world. Uh, prior to this, he also had about three years with uh, Fire Capital uh, Ventures, another uh, VC side of it. Uh, welcome, uh, Raghav, to the FLP batch, and we're looking to uh, learn from you on the uh, financial side from the VC angle. Thanks for coming. Thanks so much, guys, for having me. And apologies for the delay. I had a, you know, I have a two-year-old who was sitting in my lap while I was building this deck. <laughs> uh, so if you see, you know, please feel free to point out uh, any mathematical calculation, any conceptual errors that you see. I'll, I'll, I'll let him know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, um, you know, Santosh was talking to me about, you know, how we all feel about making projections. Um, you know, I'm assuming most of you are in that boat or thinking of jumping into that boat of becoming an entrepreneur. And um, you know, I was an entrepreneur myself. Um, you know, I tried and raised capital when there were two and a half VCs in the country. Um, this was back in 2009, 2010, um, uh, and maybe I'll talk about it at some point of time. But I remember having a conversation with my co-founder saying, "Hey, if somebody asks us for information, you know what? We'll send it over SMS as well." So the mobile revolution had not taken off, um, and as I said, there were two and a half VCs back then, and I could actually. Uh, feel that hey you know why should I why should I waste my time on that Excel uh, building those projections but now six years later I can tell you um, if you don't have a strong hold of this you're in big trouble um, and I'll you know try and convince you uh, over the next 45 minutes that it really does matter uh, feel free to stop me at any point of time um, so um, what could you do you know maybe a broad broad agenda what what I wanted to cover. And let me know if you want me to cover something else as well. Uh, why are they important? So, you know, some of the misunderstandings. Maybe we can, you know, take a shot at defining what projections are and in what context do you take them forward. Um, some building blocks, you know, love for math. Uh, you know, you'll see that. Um, and some really, really important pillars of as you build projections and uh, and how you track if you're moving in the right direction, which is, you know, your startup success. Um, so why are projections important? Uh, you know, a lot more than you might think. Okay? Uh, we live and die for this. We look at projections at board meetings. We look at projections before we invest. So it's all over the place. You could seduce VCs with great projections. Yeah, obviously, they need to fall for it. Um, you know, seduce your potential. Uh, employees, ESOPs are valuable. You won't have cash up front to give these guys. You would need to push that. You need to sell that. Um, tracking performance, uh, you know, setting internal goals. Again, something you know I've seen at least um, you know the life cycle of last six years. You know, companies that do well really, really track performance like crazy. I mean, they they metricize, if I can use that word, they pretty much metricize every aspect of the business and then they track that business against that metric. And this is across teams, this is across people, this is across functions. You know, even I've seen some of these really, really dogged, you know, entrepreneurs even put metrics against their HR managers. You know, you know what, this is the number of people we saw, this is the number of people we hired, this is the number of people we retained. So, you know, at a high level what I'm saying is, these projections need to not only translate into you saying, hey, this is your goal to the marketing team, but also to say, this is what I'm going to track you against to see how you're performing. Um, what's working, what's not working? If you don't have a plan, if you can't compare against it, you know, what do you say, what's working, what's not working? Mm -hmm. This is the single biggest question that you will get on your board every month when your board gets together saying, hey, tell us what are the three things that are working, tell us the three things that are not working. And what's not working, where are you confused, where are you lost, how can we help? And the last thing, you know, companies tend to fly blind on how much capital they need, right? I mean, if you are going into trying to raise your Series A or forget that for seed round, how do you say this much capital is enough? Until and unless you really don't know, it's like, you know, you might be diluting a lot more by raising a lot more capital because obviously valuations are going to be, you know, 
given the risk at that stage are going to be low or you are raising insufficiently uh, to hit your series A which is another disaster because you won't be able to show those metrics, that curve, that growth curve, those unit economics to the next incoming uh, investor. Right? And the way I look at it is not this, I look at it this way. If you don't have predictions, you can't do any of this stuff. And if you can't do any of this stuff, you know, it's going to be a really uphill battle. Then you need to go to friends and family and say, hey, you know what, I'll make money for you. Give me some money. So you are a question. Yeah, you are a J curve on the previous slide. So essentially the J curve, if you look at it, it's the fast curve that we see tend to <laughs> tend to see the hockey stick curve that we like to see in terms of revenue growth and in terms of engagement, in terms of interactions, depending on what kind of tool or product that you are building. That's just a uh, pure allusion to that. But each of these aspects is really, really important for you to build a sustainable business. Yeah, and, uh, sorry, before you go, sure. You would be sharing this, or we need to take notes. I could share this. I I actually blog. I might just if you like it so much, I'll put it up there. <laughs> uh, so for everybody, just give me some feedback. Um, so I thought, you know, why don't we define this? You know, why don't we give it some boundaries to say what's really a projection? What are we expecting? What are you supposed to put out? And you know, is it in line with what the goal of the startup is? Right. So I tried and put my heads around saying, can we develop a, a, you know, a definition? So I said, hey, there are some numbers to it. It's a reflection of your strategy. Right. Now, at a high level, you could say my strategy is to be profitable. Then obviously that needs to show. The other strategy, hey, I just want to grow really fast at this point of time. Hence, I'm going to see a lot of work that should show. So it needs to be in line with how you're thinking about the business. How, you know, how are you going to capture value? Is it the value is in the short in the short term is it market share which we you know could be profitability so it's a reflection of your strategy given a certain scenario okay you know excel sheet is dynamic not dynamic static you know it does not really you know it's your mind to say okay this is how it's going to play out today between a swiggy and zomato and if this is how it's going to play out that's my assessment that's my best assessment this is the path that i'm going to take right and then it's the interplay of three most important things that will drive you know, maybe I'll digress at this point of time a little. But, you know, let's assume you're going IPO, okay? There'll be a bunch of scrutiny that you'll go through. There'll be the analysts who'll be looking at your numbers. They say, this is the valuation. This is what you can achieve. Essentially, you know, it's, a, it's been a revelation for me as well that the way these analysts or the way your stock is priced, they look at your three statements. They look at your P&L cash flow balance sheet then say, hey, this is what it looks like. Oh, by the way, this is Facebook. So maybe the multiple should be slightly higher. Okay. So the focus on metrics, you know, just only goes one way. That's, you know, increasingly hard. You're scrutinized for every number that you see. Okay. So there is the interplay of the three <coughs> most important things. Okay. And I'll talk more in detail of how you should think about the construct, how you should try and model this in your head, where you can get data. <laughs> so the three things are one, top line growth, very simple, revenue growth, uh, unit level profitability, unit economics, I'm sure you've heard about this term now more than one. Um, and finally cash burn, cash is a reality, right, I mean the way I look at it is unit economics profitability is about performance, how well you did, right, cash is about survival, so these three things. And then, and then I try and say, you know, what's, what's the, What's the aim of the startup? Startup is to you know have financial returns. What will drive financial returns is high growth, being superbly capital efficient, and maximizing what's in your interest, which is valuation. Right? So these two things are completely in line of what you know your projections are and what you need to achieve and finally get out. Okay. I think this is this is really, really important that you keep in mind, okay? Especially when you are interacting with VCs, you know, any sort of investor, forget VCs, let me take that term back. You know, if, if you're interacting with any form of investor, um, and I'm assuming you're an early stage company, you're not, uh, you're not a listed entity, then if the investor is challenging you on accuracy, vis-a-vis -vis direction, maybe you should not raise capital from them. okay? So it's really having a direction saying, as I said, you know, my goal is market share with a profitability, then this is where I'm going to be. 
But if he's going to say, hey, Q3, your numbers were not hit to the T, hey, you are 10%, 20% off. If you have a genuine reason for it, yeah, obviously, you know, the, the market conditions are always changing, right? And if market conditions are changing, your inputs into the model also need to change. The output also needs to change. You need to recalibrate, right? And if that needs to happen, then obviously these things also need to change. So there needs to be constant adjustment. You need to constantly go back to this model. Be truthful to it. Saying, hey, I'm going to be true saying, I assume this. I got this wrong. Let me talk to somebody and say, hey, I got this wrong. Can I improve at predicting this for the next month? Right? And if I can, then it's great. Then I'll have much better hold on all these three things, which help me allow to raise more capital, grow faster. Okay, so it's direction versus accuracy by any standards. So while you are in it, right, uh, what's a good duration to look back and uh, recalibrate uh, a financial projection? Is it quarterly, half yearly, or should we look at the numbers every month? And so I'll tell you how this is done. And every team, you know, once you've raised, let's say, a Series A, every team has a target, right? And that target is built into this, which is internally san sanctioned at the board level, right? Right. So if you're going to say, hey, $5 million is going to last me 16 months, this is how I'm going to break it up. This is my budget for engineering. This is my budget for marketing. These are the losses that I need to fund. All that's just signed off upfront. Right. So to me, it's nearly every month I need to say today, you know, big basket, which has raised upwards of $200 million is saying, hey, these are the top six metrics that I have that I need to measure. And I see it at a board level, actual versus budgeted. It's a month-on-month -month exercise. Let's take a step back. You know, we are all early stage, uh, not even at a series A. That's uh, fine. Somewhere around seed. Yeah. So, uh, sh should my focus be the same uh, in terms of financial metrics versus my uh, product? Because right now I'm a very small team, maybe two, three member team. Right. So I'm stretched too far or too thin. So should I? So I come to that. I think the hidden question there is, do I have the data to be able to put this? Right. Yeah. Is that the question? Yeah. And so how I'm often should I look that. at it? So I'm just coming to that, saying, hey, is it a garbage in, garbage out situation yeah. uh, where I have some stupid inputs and there are some stupid outputs? You know, you'll always be improving. Nobody's perfect at making projections. I wish that was the case with me, but uh, nobody's <coughs> accurate at making projections. But you know, at some, at every stage, you need to make projections, and you're always making them in the mind. Hey, how much time will the product take? to ship out. That's even a, that's also a projection, right? It's, it is a number and it will be an interplay on your revenue, unit economics and cash that you need. If it's going to take a one year longer, you need much more cash mm -hmm. to survive that period, right? Okay. So exactly to that, I think the next slide talks about that. So how do we avoid a garbage in, garbage out situation, right? And I think, you know, as entrepreneurs, there's so much uncertainty that you need to thrive in. I think there's data all over the place, right? At least these are the three buckets that I saw. Now, when I go back and I say, hey, I didn't have data, you know, there is always some data that we have. You know, don't you know what's the customer's willingness to pay for your product? You definitely have a sense, right? Do you know, you know, what will your, you know, a top engineer cost you? You definitely know that value. So my sense is if you all, you know, just put your mind to it and not discard it upfront, you always find ways, you know, to be able to get data. You know, Big Basket starting out, did they not know how much customers spend? What's the frequency of buy? It was the offline world, we were just moving to the online world. Right? Unless and until you are creating something which is just going to be dramatically different. Um, you know, we are all mimicking some offline behavior in, you know, in the online world. Right? That's what's essentially happening. Right? And if that's happening, you will have a sense or a direction of what these numbers are and what it might look like. Right. So there is always some data available in the offline world, which you can pull. It's now about your thought process and your commitment to saying, hey, you know what, I need to pick these numbers up and see if it actually makes sense or not. And I'll come back to my example of how I did not do this. Um, other startups, you know, there are a bunch of mature startups out there, right? I mean, it just takes a call saying, you know, how are you seeing that? How did you solve for something like this? You know between my portfolio today, between some of the mature guys and some of the early guys, there's a lot of information exchange that's happening today in terms of saying, hey, you know, especially, you know, I invest in a lot of marketplaces saying, you know, how do I structure supply side? You know, what's the incentive structure that I should be on the supply side? You know, Ola had a very, you know, effective 
uh, supply side uh, incentive at some point of time. Now Travel Triangle is looking at that. Then you know Swiggy is adopting the same. So what I'm saying is there is enough that's, that can be circulated where people have actually seen these problems and that can be passed on to you. And the third, you know, your VCs, they've seen enough. Right, they've seen enough, they've hopefully lost money in enough to know where they should not put their money and where, you know, some of these investments went wrong. There's enough that, um, you know, data that they can give you. Right, so the fact that, you know, we are very early stage guys, we might not have this data. I think, you know, when you're pitching to, see, there are, there are maybe broadly three or four ways in which you kind of raise capital. And the stage you might be in is, hey, great guy. You know, he's a good guy, let's give them money. You know, this money is going to be very diluted and at the end of the day, this money is dumb as well. We really don't know what you're going to do, right? How do I help when you are maybe figuring out what you need to do, right? If Ravinder Jadeja doesn't know if it's going to turn or not, the batsman definitely doesn't know if it's going to turn or not, <laughs> right? So the idea is um, for you to be on top of this thing saying, you know, at the end of the day, I'm going to make a business. I'm solving a problem, but I'm going to make a business out of it. And if, I, if you were to go to a VC at this point of time, where you say, hey, these are the three things that I definitely know. These are the seven things I definitely don't know, but these are approximate numbers to which I feel that these are the you know ballpark it can fall into. I believe I need $3 million. Your ability or probability to be able to raise capital, you just go out of the roof. Okay. I mean, the kind of confidence that you will develop with your investor will just be great. Did I answer some somewhat yeah. to what you were saying? Got it. So maybe I thought you know I spent some time saying sorry go ahead. Uh, may, may I have a question? So uh, when we do these projections, I mean of course we all would have done it on a piece of paper at some point in time. Correct. But uh, Whenever I mean, in my experience, whenever I talk about those projections, uh, the next question that comes in is, okay, this this looks like the best case, uh, you know, best case project prediction. Right. So there are like best case, worst case scenarios. Correct. So I mean, then, so what is your like take on it? So how do you from best case to worst case? How do you really because that is not you are targeting, right? The worst case is not what you are targeting. Right. So then, how do you project that number? See, as an entrepreneur, um, you need to you need to be you know obviously pitching for the best but be prepared for the worst so the way I, the way i would think about when i was a, when i was an entrepreneur is i'm going to pitch what's best but i'm going to raise cash on the worst plan right so in my hearts of hearts i've actually done that math saying boss you know what it might not look like 10 clients it might just look like 3 right and i'm still developing my product at that point of time people still don't know about me i still need to spread the message about my product Right. So I think at an early stage, it's really important that you be upfront with the VC, with the investor. Right. Hey, I believe that I need between, you know, it can't be like I need between two and ten. Okay. Well, that means you still haven't done your homework. But, <laughs> but if you can come and say, hey, I need between, you know, between two and four. With two, this is where I can reach. And with four, this is where I can reach. And I'm happy with two at this point to see where this lands. And then depending on how aggressive the investor is or how much he believes in you, he will say, okay, maybe you know two is the right number, prove some of these metrics out. And once that uncertainty goes away, I'll give you another two. And then you know you negotiate saying if that's the case, that you know if my two is going to come six months down the line, my valuation goes different. Right. So I'm sure you know this. Um, uh, so what I thought I would broadly do is to give you some simple ways of, you know, developing this quickly. I don't want you to be wasting a lot of time on this. Um, you need to get this out and then, you know, keep, it's a, it's an iteration like your product keeps getting better over time as you understand the business better. Um, am I going in the right direction? Am I not going in the right direction? Please just let me know. Right. Um, So this might be a little hard. I, you know, I couldn't find a better way of depicting this, but this is something that goes into my mind when I am evaluating a startup. Um, uh, so in this triangle, what I'm essentially trying to achieve is, you know, what's your contribution? Okay. You know, what's your business contribution looks like? And when I define contribution, it's essentially revenue minus direct costs. 
what does how much lost or how much profit do you make with to serve the customer all direct costs okay and i'll define those direct costs very clearly for you so there are there are three parts to this okay um and let me just read it out first and you know give you some context um so the first angle is you know i'm assuming your product is ready in some shape or form okay so the first is marketing efficiency i put in a dollar how many dollars of new revenue do i create new revenue okay so month one i put in some x dollars i got some y dollars of revenue <coughs> next month i put in another you know let's say i put in 2 dollars i got 10 dollars of new revenue that 10 dollars some of it will retain with me some of them will go away right but then i put in another 2 dollars how much new revenue did i create so every month in a sense i want you to track on what's in your mind that if you put in a dollar of marketing how many new customers will you acquire and how much will they give you in terms of revenue okay so that's the first arm right the second arm which is a, which i already mentioned is revenue retention right how many customers did if you acquired in month 1 actually came back in month 2 right and give you some money so that the, that's the two break points of your of your revenue two parts of your revenue how much did i get how much did i retain and how much new that i'm able to create and the third you know leg of this triangle is to say how much did i make or lose after i serviced that customer so somebody ordered a mobile phone right and now did he did he you know how much did i spend to acquire him what was my revenue out of that you know servicing that mobile phone will he buy another mobile phone next month most likely not but did he buy something else that will be captured in revenue retention right and then how much money did i make after packaging it delivering it warehousing it is what my contribution was which gives you a sense that i spent a dollar on raghav acquiring him how much money did i actually make on broadly there this is on the first transaction or on multiple transactions but this raghav. is on a customer level this is on yeah. raghav level yeah on raghav huh. but the first month alone or on on the multitude of it's a multitude like, obviously i it's a lifetime you know lifetime. how much will raghav come back with and obviously this is going to be a lot this you you keep getting better at it but what i'm saying is you know you need to make a start on getting this triangle <laughs> fixed if you can get this i mean most of the companies today whatever maturity level they don't have a handle on all these three right do they maybe they know how sorry go ahead. so how do you predict the lifetime of the customer over what what i'll come to that i'll come to that so the revenue retention is probably got another connotation to it which is which is uh, before the before the uh, before the cross contribution especially if there's a business where your aggregator and then the total revenue versus weekend revenue you talking about gm yeah no on gm so there's a cross gm we was and then there's a you're not taking out your sgna <coughs> there's a retain revenue that you get because which is if it's a model where you're getting paid so that the total revenue right then that takes you would look at the other revenue not in the no, no, then then the gmb concept goes out there so the entire gmb plus then then the order was taken off is the retain revenue and that's the the revenue retention that you're talking about is really getting in the ntv So I have not said GMV anywhere. You've not said it. I mean, just since, since this is time. revenue. GMV is not revenue. Yeah. Yes. It's not. Okay. It's not it's revenue. Not, but so when I say retained revenue, what I'm essentially saying is, you know, maybe you transacted for a mobile at you know hundred dollars. My margin was two percent, so two dollars. Next month I bought a shirt. How much was that? And how much did I give me? I'm not recording GMV anywhere. Good. So you had a question. So. Um, When you say cost of acquiring, let's say Raghav is a customer, right? That that could include uh, promotions, discounts, etc. That could also include marketing expenses. Are you are you categorizing those as SGMA versus direct yeah, cost? Or no, marketing cost, right? Direct marketing cost to acquire this customer. So I'm not including marketing people's salary, but I'm including promotions. I'm including discounts, all campaign costs. So you need to understand, and the way to understand this is. what do i need to incur this again next month and do i need to incur more of it 
So your marketing salary at some point of time is going to tap out. Right? With Flipkart, that kind of GMV, they're now tapping out in terms of saying, you know, we don't need more marketing professionals. Right? But yeah, you know, amount of money that you need to continue to acquire will scale. So that's the amount. If that's the you know high level logic to say what should I include and what should I not include. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, sorry, no problem. Uh, just a question. Um, Can you be louder? Uh, just a question. If your if your marketing cost is mostly coming from inventory, so if you're giving away promotional products or discounting them heavily, uh, that's your main way that you market. Uh, then I mean, is there a way that you should, um, I mean, is there a way that you calculate that cost? Do you calculate from your market value or do you calculate from your cost price or on the on the cost of goods sold? I didn't get the question. Can you give me an example? Uh, I design musical devices. Sorry? So I design musical devices. So if I have to do a promotion where I say there's a contest and the, the first three entrants win a certain star set. Um, if I need to take that as a marketing cost for my books, do I take it on the sale value of the price or do I take it on the cost of goods sold? It's the real value that you've lost. Real value that's lost. So. so imagine that you were that you are doing a Google campaign, the same amount of money. Okay. That's the acquisition cost. Okay, uh, just one question. Uh, so how how this thing uh, work in the B two B case? Uh, because I mean the example that you gave were more like uh, it actually works better in B two B case. But yeah, go ahead. <laughs> So I just want to understand, well, basically uh, there, um, let's say you spend your marketing effort once and then obviously you don't have to spend marketing effort again and again on the same customer if, if, they, if you retain them, right? Correct. Uh, but again the servicing cost keep... Uh, Which is captured in contribution model. Uh, so right. this is the third like that I was talking uh, about. But when you, uh, let's say, uh, uh, do calculation of your product value or uh, what value you sell them, uh, you ultimately make one single product and send it to multiple people, right? So it's mm -hmm. like in the mobile phone case, uh, one test consumer, you send one mobile phone and second consumer, you have to make new products and here, uh, it's more like uh, you make it once and then it's like a, either a service or subscription, something like that. Correct. In those cases. So uh, so how do you divide that cost uh, in terms of multiple customers? Because that's your main Which cost? The, the, the product cost, uh, when you want to offer them uh, the product. This is... In terms cost of, of servicing the customer or in terms of product development cost? Uh, combine both. So there are two very different costs. So let, let's take an example. An ongoing cost is support cost. Right. Right. Or your server cost. You know, if the number of customers go up, your server cost goes up. Number of customers go up, you know, customer support cost goes up. Exactly. So that's the cost of servicing that customer. Exactly. That's okay. it in your contribution model. Okay. Product development goes below this. Okay. Any cost that does not scale with customer servicing or acquisition stays out of this contribution travel. Okay. So, so just to close this out, I, I might be a little cryptic, but you know, hopefully we'll get hopefully we'll get a little more clear. So, marketing efficiency, revenue retention, and contribution margin. These are really your variables. If you can nail all these three down, please give me a call. Okay. Uh, if you can nail, if any, if you can nail down every, even two of them, please do give me a call. Okay. So what I'm saying is these are three variables, and your input or output is say if marketing spend, I decide to spend twenty million dollars, uh, then an output you will see, right? So marketing spend is an input that you decide. New revenue is an output that you see depending on market conditions, right? Revenue retention again depends on how good or bad your service is and obviously nature of the product. So you see total revenue, which is again an output. And then finally, depending on contribution margin, you say, hey, what's my return on marketing? Okay. So, so for a business which does not want to monetize in the short term, two, three years, so those numbers don't hold so It So I'll just change, this is just a nomenclature. So let's say there's no revenue, okay? In that case, marketing efficiency becomes critically important. Did Pinterest, where we were first investors, were they spending anything on marketing to acquire users zero? And that was the need of the business, right? Because they were not monetizing. I mean, if, imagine if they were cost of acquisition was similar to some of the B2C startups, e-commerce startups, they would have died in three months, right? So now, retention, were they retaining users? That was a critical input for us, right? That it's not a leaky bucket. So it's not revenue retention, then it's customer retention. 
right? And then in terms of contribution margin, you make a projection saying, hey, you know, at some point of time, I'm going to be 250 million MAUs. At that point of time, let's assume a CPM which is one tenth of that approval. Does that make sense? If it does make sense, you get invested. Okay. So this remains irrespective of B2B, B2C, monetizing in the short run, long run. <coughs> this is the ultimate truth. These three variables are the ultimate truth of how well you're going to do. But what if you're not spending on marketing? Like Perfect. What, what happens there? Like if you're only looking for organic or maybe referral uh, based growth and you're also not monetizing, how does this whole picture apply? So if you're not spending on marketing, let's talk. And if you're still getting an option. <laughs> so those are the most powerful businesses, right? I mean, Facebook, Uber, Airbnb, uh, you know, Pinterest, all these businesses did not spend a lot on marketing at all because it was the need of the customer. Wherever you're going to push a product, you will need to do marketing. And then, you know, hope and pray that you're able to monetize. Right? So if, you're, if there is viral growth, there is something that you're doing. Now to layer on to that, that only not viral growth is not really the most important bit. The other important bit is retention. Groupon, max, crazy viral growth, right? People were ordering, you know, people were getting stuff worth 100 for 50 bucks. But did it stay back? That was a big question. Did Groupon make money on contribution? That was a big question, right? So what I'm saying is, um, if you are not spending anything on marketing, maybe you are you're on to something really interesting. In that case, if you go to a VC and say, hey, I have a million dollars in potential revenue, zero CAC. Right? It's very powerful metric. Right? Did I answer the question or? Yeah, it makes sense. So with this triangle in, let's say, in, you know, in some context, um, you know, I thought maybe I'll help you build a small, very crisp, very basic model as to how I would have done it some time ago, okay? So let's say I decide how much, so I'm, I'm going to go, you know, bottom up. I'm going to try and calculate the new revenue that I'm going to generate, okay? So two inputs to that. Um, I need to know my marketing efficiency. So broadly, I will make calls, I will call VCs and saying, what's my CAC? What do you think is broadly the CAC, right? Or maybe on one zero, I'll just go ahead and spend. You know, this is my best bet. I know they're my customers are, are, you know, lurking here. Maybe they're doing Google searches or they're on Facebook. I spend about $20, okay? And at, at some stage during this conversation, I'm going to add a million to this. But let's say I spent about $20, okay? And my marketing efficiency was, let's say, five times. So for every dollar of marketing, I got $5 of revenue, okay? So that means my new revenue, month one, I just started off, right? I got $100. Clear? Simple math? Basic math. Right? Next month, I retain 50%. That's a crazy retention metric though, if you can achieve that. So 50% of the, my customers came back next month. So, wow, $50 in the bank contracted, well done. Next month, I spend again another 20. Right? My marketing efficiency remains the same. It never remains the same. Okay? Uh, I get another 100, 150. So, I grew by 50%. Right, 100, and I went to 150. My contribution was 10%. <coughs> okay, so I said, you know, after, you know, you know, delivering the product or the service, I, you know, 10% still remain. So that's 15 dollars, and I had spent 20 on marketing, so I have a five dollar gap here. Is is everybody clear with this? So this is how I would do it. As simple as that. So. All these variables stacked up in my Excel, saying, hey, this is how much I'm going to spend. This is my sense of how my marketing efficiency is going to evolve. This is my revenue. I believe people will come back to the extent of 50% next month. And if that's the case, this is how I'm going to move. And that is my cash requirement for the first month. So you spent 40 on marketing, right? How? So month one marketing is already answered. Months two. I'm just talking months two, right? Oh, you're just talking four months? Months two. Okay. Yeah, that's right. So, so the, the way my Excel will show minus 20 for first month and minus 5 for the next month. So the total capital requirement is 25. That's right. Okay. But I'm doing a PL for that month. So, uh, largely any model is depending upon the assumptions you're writing, right? In, in your case, your assumption, your large assumption is your retention, right? That is where largely any model can be broken apart. It, 
too optimistic and we have a hundred million dollar valuation, too pessimistic and we have a ten million dollar. How do you drive better assumptions here? Do you look at comparable startups and what they have done? For example, how do I look at what could be my retention rate? When I've not really hit for for this group, which is so early, where I'm not even possibly am yeah. have any money. Again, as I said, you know, I, I don't know if you missed the slide where I talked about garbage in, garbage out. There are broadly three or four ways in which you can predict. I know, I'm not saying you're going to be accurate. <laughs> to me, even 20-30% you're off, it's okay. Right, again, don't go after accuracy, go after direction. Right, if this 50 is 5, then we are in trouble. Right, but if this 50 is 30, I'm okay. Okay, it's a start that we are making. So what I'm saying is, one, if you are mimicking some offline behavior, if you know if you are selling grocery online, you know how many times I'm buying. <coughs> if you are you know allowing me to book cabs on on the app, you know how many times I would like to take a cab, right? So if there is an offline behavior, you will know. If I'm buying fashion products, you know men will buy maybe once in three months, women will buy six times during that period. So what I'm saying is. I mean, it's just, if you think hard enough, you will be able to see a parallel. And just in case not, then you talk to somebody. But try and get as accurate as possible, because as I said, if this minus 5 is minus 15, you've done a gross, you've done big injustice to be able to raise capital. And if this minus 5 was actually 0, then why even raise 5? You're diluting like crazy. And there is no glory, trust me, in raising capital. It's only dilution. If I today, if you put a gun to my head and say you need to build a startup, yeah, obviously, you know, um, you know, my value for time is, you know, the way I value it. I obviously want it to be a massive outcome and not a lifestyle business. But if that's going to be the case, I want to raise the minimum amount of capital I want. So we were. Let me give you another example, okay? So uh, we were in first investors in this company called Yelp, okay? And we took out, a, I think we took out a 30x on that investment. Um, I know how much you, how many of you know, Yelp total, took a total of $20 million to be profitable. Okay. So, and they had raised 50. So when they were doing their road shows for their IPO, the slide came up saying that, hey, up till now we've used $50 million. So there was a small suggestion from the banker. He said, okay, you said that you've raised 50, but out of that 50, 30 is still in the bank. So everybody said, hey, you know, why do you want to mention this? You know, $50 million, we did a good job of fundraising, X, Y, Z, stuff there. But the CEO said, let me try this. So he tried for a, you know, couple of large investors. He said, hey, you know what, by the way, we raised $50 million, 30 is still in the bank, 20 is still available. Uh, no, 20 is something that I consume. Every large investor stopped and made a note of that. Capital efficiency is the game. You need to be profitable, large, with the least amount of capital. Make sense? So, broadly clear about this, that now you can build a simple month one, month two model saying, hey, this is how it looks like in the first month, something I'll retain, something I'll lose, and then depending on my marketing dollars and depending on how much I want to grow, let's say you know you wanted to grow much faster. So let's say you are month zero, or month one, right? Next year you wanted to see you know 100% growth. Right? So then you can adjust your marketing dollars now. Right? Saying, hey, now I need to spend this much, that means this minus five is going to look very different. But I really want to grow fast and capture markets, but nobody else comes in. Again, a slightly better handle. You know, every small delta will matter in terms of how closer you can get in terms of deciding how much money you want. Right? Now, what I want you to do a little is, you know, if I go back here, the other question that I, um, you know, very interesting company called Travel Triangle, you know, CEO came up and asked me, um, you know, you've given me this framework, you know, I like this framework, I understand this well. Which is the most important metric? If I was to start optimizing, you know, I've grown really well, I'm growing fast, but if I had to optimize or be very, very, or one is optimization or be just very, very cognizant of what can cause me to derail, which metric would that be? That's so equally important, right? There are three metrics that you're running with, right? And it's, trust me, it's very hard to optimize even one. And they are all interrelated, right? 
So then how do you work around this? Any any guesses which is the most important metric? Retention. The contribution. Retention. Why do you say that? Because the cost of acquiring a new user, which will eventually turn into revenue, is much higher than getting the money from the sale. Okay, I keep that in mind. Any, any other guesses? I think the marketing efficiency. Why do you say that? That's where all your assumptions are coming into play. Got it. Depends on the stage in which you are, right? I think it depends, on, depends on the stage of the company or, or Why you say what. That? So when you're actually growing very, very quickly, you would want to probably focus on marketing efficiency. How do I spend the least and get the most number of customers? And then you have reached a stage where you've got a, a sizable chunk of customers, you need to focus on retention. And then possibly also start looking at how do I monetize or how do I get squeeze out the maximum contribution from that. So it again depends on, on what your objectives are and, and which stage you're in. So let me put a context to this. Let's all be in an early stage bucket. Let's not go to the IPO stage at this point. So if you are all in the early stage bucket, then does your then what are you optimizing for? Let me ask you this. If you're an early stage company, what are I'm you? I'm optimizing for survival. Just cash. Yeah, cash. But you need to achieve also. You need to perform also. Right. So you're optimizing for growth. Can't forget that, right? <laughs> so you need to show your growth <laughs> and as well as survival. Right? That's what you're fighting for in life every day. So with these two metrics, I said, okay, if these are the two metrics that you are that you are playing with, then let's do what I do best. Let's let's do a scenario analysis, right? Let's move each of these parameters by 20% up or down, and see how growth and cash is getting affected mathematically. Fair enough. So if I bump up my marketing efficiency by 20%, what happens to growth and cash? And or if I go down by 20%, then what's happens? And across these three variables to see which is most important, at least mathematically. And then we can debate, you know, what stage, you know, what are you doing, how much cash in the bank. <coughs> if you are overvalued and you have a lot of cash, then you don't need to optimize anything. So, you know, stuff like that. <coughs> so I don't know if I'm going to go crazy mathematical, please stop me if you're not. But the idea is not the math, the idea is to get the message, right? And you know, I'll summarize this so if you even hold the message true, it's fine. Okay. Um, so this is where we were, you know, broadly, if you can just make a note, a mental note, you know, that we were losing about $5. Now let's maybe add a million context to this. We were using $5 million a month, okay? Um, $150 million in top line, still losing $5 million a month, um, and $20 million of marketing spend, right? Um, so what did I do here? I said, let's, Let's move the marketing efficiency a tad bit. Okay, so I move marketing efficiency from five to four. All right, so that's about a twenty percent drop. Now what happened? So let's see what happened. The retention remained the same. So I did a hundred bucks, a hundred million dollars, came down to fifty million dollars next month, and I spent the same amount of marketing. That's what the you know the board had budgeted. I'm not flexible in terms of moving it up right now. So twenty million dollars. I created eighty million dollars of new revenue. So now it's about $130 million. My growth fell off 50% to 30%. I want you to go out and track a public company where the growth fell off year on year from 50 to 30%. Check out what happened to the stock price. Okay, just do this mental math. What happened to the stock price? Um, contribution, I'm held constant again at 10%. So now I do $30 million and I spent 20 and my cash requirement went from minus five to minus seven. You know, these numbers are looking small and maybe, you know, if my son had allowed, I would just put another zero. My cash requirement actually went from minus 50 to minus 70. Right? So growth got hit, cash requirement got hit. And hit massive. Right? So, at least to what I've seen mathematically and I've seen when companies die, is that they just can't get their marketing efficiency in place. You can get a great product in place, but if you're not able to distribute in the most efficient way possible, trust me, you're going to either see massive dilution or you're going to die sooner or later. So growth and burn, huge, huge function of your marketing efficiency. Right, do you have a question? Gives you a sense? Let's play with some of the other ways. How do you, so Francis, uh, how do you uh, link the marketing contribution towards the new revenue? Uh, because there could be other things that uh, contribute to that as well. 
right? In terms of, like, say, for example, customer references, the B two B product. That's fine, right? Uh, you're not doing any uh, incurring any marketing costs over there. Perfect. That's organic growth. That's fine. So your marketing efficiency goes up. It's another oh, new customer okay. added to your bucket. <coughs> no, see, marketing spend mm -hmm. is what you are spending on direct, like on marketing, specific marketing uh, activities, right? Uh, but if you get a reference from a customer which you haven't even saw, they go and talk to their friends and stuff, and then you get uh, sort of business through that, you'd have to remove that from the new revenue you're getting, right? Because it's not directly linked to the marketing spend. It's not direct. So that's another question altogether. Hey, is my marketing working or not? This is a simple projection. What you're saying is right, but I would attribute it. This is how Uber grew, this is how Ola grew, this is how the Big Basket grew, saying, you know, people started talk. So marketing efficiency actually improved. Now the question that you're asking is, hey, you know, there's a lot of organic happening, should I actually cut marketing? Or should I become more efficient on that $20 million? Then that kind of data is looked upon. That where did he actually come from? That's the attribution analysis. Saying, did Rayo come from Google, or did Rayo, you know, came through a referral, and if it referral, should I run a referral program or not? more tactical looking at, you know, how you spend money across channels. This is a simple man. And if it's if it's happening, great, you'll actually see, um, you know, your marketing efficiency go up. So these are real hard numbers. You know, these are hard numbers that you will decide to say, how much cash does the business need? I'm talking about that type of projections. Right? So let's play with some other variables. Let's see uh, if I got that right late in the night. Um, what did I do here? Retention. I played with retention. So I said retention comes off now. Initially I was re retaining 50%, now I'm retaining 40%. <coughs> um, everything else remains the same. Growth fell off again, um, very intuitive, 40%. And with growth falling off, I had a cash hit as well. But both were fairly muted. Against what happened in marketing action. I'm not saying it's not important. I'm just now marking out relative importance. Okay. So you can't forget retention. It goes to, if this goes to zero and your marketing efficiency also plummets, you're out of business. Right? But if I was to really obsess about something, it would be my marketing efficiency. And the two are linked. So retention is a is a is a derivative of efficiency. Retention, I won't, you know, intuitively I won't you know, put it out to marketing. That's the case when you're not a real business. You know, the fact that you did a good job and the customer keeps coming back. You don't need a marketing for a returning customer. You acquired him, you let him know, hey, you know, here's a great service. The next time he comes, he comes on his own. Yeah, the next time, hey, you know what? Ola doesn't need to market me again to, you know, book a cab. So why are they valued higher? The higher frequency businesses are valued higher is what you think. Yeah, and what point? Thanks for pointing that out. Um, see, higher frequency businesses means essentially means more touch points. More touch points mean you know the customer evaluates you day in, day out. And if you do a good job, brand creation becomes far easier. Becomes very, very easy. If it's a low frequency, you need to remind him every time <coughs> next year again that hey, you know what, I'm still alive. That time, again, you're spending more dollars. But if you are continuously reacting with that, if it becomes a habit, it becomes a drug, you know, brand creation comes becomes very, very easy. And your marketing efficiency automatically goes up. That's why if you see, you know, uh, most of these companies where, you know, BBC companies, you know, the frequency is really high, uh, you know, their valuations, all everything else given is, is high. Because you actually see, that with far less marketing dollars, you're able to achieve far more. Which again takes me to the point that if you're growing in a capital luxury manner, then you should be valued more. Just, just a question. So, uh, so just taking the same point uh, and taking the example of Ola. So if I don't use Ola for a week and, and they send me a SMS saying, you know, you know, get 50%, 50 rupees off. I will put that in contribution. That goes into contribution. Okay. So every business has a marketing in contribution as well because that is to bring back a guy. So that I would count that, right? And then I said, let's play with contribution. 
So maybe I'll just come back to that just wrong you guys. Um, so everything else same, uh, retention 50%, okay, not that sleepy. And then contribution goes to 5%, what happened? Growth remains intact, right? Growth wasn't affected. Uh, but cash requirements again moved, right? So essentially, you know, contribution, if there is a path to being contribution positive, you know, we all can live with it, right? That at some stage, at some scale, you will be contribution positive. But, you know, you have the other two things figured out. If you have marketing efficiency and retention figured out, you can be a really valuable asset. So this is what Flipkart's banking on. A lot of companies are banking. <laughs> so, so what I'm saying is, if you have these three in place, perfect. Even if you have two in place, my ideal situation is that you at least, if you have marketing efficiency and retention, your ability to raise capital and your ability to raise capital at a significant uh, step up to your valuation just goes out of it. So, so just to, you know, I, it's on my blog now. I, I did a detailed model there. If you, you know, if your love for numbers still exists, you know, go out and check it out. You know, there's, so this is what actually came out. And let me try and explain this, what I did. I said, uh, effect on growth and effect on cash flow. These were the two things that we were trying to understand. Uh, we said, this is what, you know, I need to get growth, but I need to still survive with the cash that I have in the bank. If I hit marketing efficiency by, improve by 20%, my growth moves up by 20%. Right, and it goes down by 20% if my marketing efficiency gets hit. If revenue retention goes up by 20%, my growth only goes up by 8%. If it is hit by 20%, it goes down by the same number. Right, and in terms of contribution margin, we just saw if contribution margin moves, my cash burn moves, but my growth doesn't. Move. So this is just a summary. This is a summary of, you know, or maybe a more complicated way of looking at it. But, you know, just intuitive to my eyes to say, you know, if you move these variables 20% up or down, what's the effect on and growth and cash burn? So as I said, you know, if your product is growing virally and organically and you're retaining guys, please do give me a shout. I think you're on to something valuable. Um, there are enough and more examples, Uber, Facebook, Pinterest, um, you know, being created on the back of, you know, massive, massive organic growth, right? So if you are not getting organic growth, think about it. You know, is there a product market fit issue? Um, or if, you know, it's okay if you're not getting organic growth, but if you get paid from the customer, which generally happens on the B2B side, then you're okay to spend money. You need to spend money to make money. Otherwise, you know, just be great at fundraising. <laughs> <laughs> Something you do. Right? Um, and finally, you know, the point that I've been driving that, you know, the relative ranking between the three is that you know obsess about marketing efficiency, retention, and contribution in that order? If growth and cash burn are your are your uh, models. Yeah, that's about it. So, uh, so one is about the projections. Just going back to a question I think Ravi asked about uh, the assumptions you made. See, the early stage startup right now, in the market can be anything. Right? I mean, I mean, how? So when you want to predict for, let's say, the first year, right? I mean, depending on the way you look at it from some market data, you could say I'm going to capture one percent, two percent, four percent, and that would, you know, the difference would be millions. Yeah, I'll be, I'll be bottoms up. I won't be tops down, top down on my, on my model. Like I said, I will decide in month one, am I going to spend twenty million dollars or ten million dollars? Then I say, this is what I expect in terms of new revenue. I'm not going to say, hey, the market for groceries is about $350 billion, which is 50% of India's retail. I'm going to capture 5% in one That doesn't work. It's an approach on the model. You just can't say that. You do that to back calculate saying, hey, this is what I'm assuming in year one. What's the market share of the total market? So you're saying you work out your cost project your cause. And then build your revenue assumptions. You need to incur something to get something, right? Okay, and I'm the, I'm the 
and the cost assumptions you make based on your best case scenario, worst case scenario, and then you say where you actually then you kind of where you are as an entrepreneur, how confident you are okay. of where I'm going to land. So I would say marketing efficiency, how much I want to spend, new revenue, retention, contribution margin, fixed cost, EBITDA. See, God, just on that, see, a fair handle of the cost structure. Okay, in terms of how much is required for, say, the next one year. But it's very hard to say how much revenue that's going to generate. That means you don't have a hold on marketing efficiency. Okay. But are there some uh, some guidelines or things that you can use to say that, you know, in the industry, uh, you know, it's 10%, 20%, and therefore you take that to... So it varies drastically on which sector, what is the competitive intensity, how desperate is your client to get your product. So, you know, maybe there's a fourth bucket, which you say, I, I'll go out and experiment. I'll put a direct sales force. I'll also put an inside sales team. I'll also run Google campaigns. Let's see what's working. I have some money of my own. I can use some data to... And then some data to extrapolate. Because anything out of the air, then again, you're doing a massive disservice to yourself. You're not realizing that how, you know, your probability of dying goes up significantly. Okay. So let's apply the same man. If you need to acquire more customers, you need more inside sales team. So it's definitely going to sit in your marketing efficiency. So, so uh, on the marketing side, especially for B2B, what are the various channels? Generally, you say uh, has more efficiency. Is it the direct sales which works better for B2B or? Um, Again, it depends on sectors. It depends on the sector, it depends on the nature of your product. But for enterprises, let's say. Yeah, enterprise. Depends on the complexity of the product, depends on the price point. Let's say you're selling something worth 100,000. Mm -hmm. There is no way you can somebody can sell that on 100,000. You're selling something for 50 bucks. Fresh dust. Let's take an example. You know, great product, outstanding growth. Uh, the company was able to sell it online. Right? Why? Because the product is simple and the price point is lower. If the product is complex, requires 10 integrations, and you're selling it worth 100,000, best of luck to you trying to sell it on. So, price and complexity. And this applies across, this applies to B2C as well. Why can't you sell real estate online? Because it's complex and it's, it's a heavy price. Well, uh, marketing efficiency could uh, be impacted by market factors, right? Like demonetization could have impacted Flipkart's. This is the least, yeah. Your competition comes in and bids more on Google, your marketing efficiency is impacted. Yes, yeah, so how do you judge that the next month you're again going to put in that much of dollars to marketing and try to increase the marketing efficiency? See, again, don't go by accuracy. Mm -hmm. You're not going to get it accurate. Yeah, not getting, getting it accurate. But 10 days into the month, you will know somebody else is bidding more on your keyword. Right? It's not that you're doing it on the 31st, 12 noon. You are you are looking at these results in your internal dashboard. No, something that you don't have a control on, something like demonetization. How do you realize that next month should I keep pumping in money for marketing or should I hold it? Yeah, and demonetization you will see. You'll see the effect that suddenly orders went uh, went down, cut marketing, cut your campaigns, push out offline marketing. See on a daily basis you know I get 200 orders on a daily basis. Suddenly that 200 is looking like 5, you know, something gone wrong. Cut down the cost. You take cost out, if that's required. I, just, just one quick one. Uh, I saw you had the metrics like something called as a bit less capex or something. Sorry, sorry, that was, uh, that was some typo. Oh. I'll tell it. I'll let my son. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, the question I have is slightly uh, away from the marketing. Uh, to quickly understand, since we are all at early stage, uh, there's a notion that we have to go to VC yeah. when we need a substantial fund raise. Otherwise, it's going to be uh, uh, you know, a waste of time for both ends. Mm -hmm. uh, how true is it, or uh, should I have a, a fair plan where I, even if my need is about 100, 150k to run the experiment now on the marketing or, or on the product, 
to find a, a basic uh, PMF. Yeah, you need a prank. Unless and until it's your dad or friends or family. Mm -hmm. I have a dad. Even my dad asked me for a prank and asked him. <laughs> <laughs> so, you not having a plan is yeah. a huge negative. Right? Mm -hmm. So, you'll need a plan. Now, the other question is, um, is it, uh, you know, who should we go to mm -hmm. if we want to raise half a million dollars? See, it's fairly obvious. If you come to me for half a million dollars, uh, you know, we are a 1.6 billion dollar fund. So, effectively, we are a business as well. Mm. Right. So if we are to you know take a half a million dollar bets, then you can calculate the number of bets I need to take to deploy 1.6 billion dollars. It's not that we don't do it, we do it, but we do it sporadically. Then there are a list of funds that who only do half a million dollars or lesser. Obviously your probability there is higher. So it's not that you should not go to a VC. The only thing I check you on that, and maybe I'll take my VC hat off at this point of time. See, if you if you go to a VC for let's say 100k, let's say you go to a marquee VC, 100k, he gives it to you, he says, and it's charity for him to some extent, right? Here they are 100k, अच्छा बंदा. So you take 100k, you have a plan in place, you're fighting, but plans don't go according to plan, right? There will be ups and downs. You come back after eight months and say, hey, it didn't go, I want to try a new technique. And this time I need two million dollars. What happened? And then you say, okay, if this VC is not interested, let me go to the 10 others. The 10 others will say, what does that one guy who's not supporting this guy know that I don't know about this? So your ability to raise capital, a new round, when things are not looking good, goes down significantly. Having said that, if I had gone to an angel and raised 100k and you know my plan didn't go according to plan and the angel says sorry I'm not investing, you can always tell the VC, hey that angel does not invest more than 100k. <laughs> <laughs> He's not part of it. So what I'm saying is, you know, that apart, you know, that's more, you know, it's more trivial than anything else. If there is merit, you will raise capital. The only thing I'm trying to tell you is um, you know, we as VCs tend to do as much work on a 100k deal than on a 20 million dollar check. Is that good enough for your return on time? Something that we need to decide. Yeah, I mean, we obviously, or we like to believe that we have more perspective than angels. Um, and I think that's more or less true if you ask my personal opinion. So if you want to bounce off ideas, if you want to see, you know, where this could die. See, look at the business model for an angel. Angel will not write five checks. He needs to write 75 checks. And then hope and pray that two fire and you know the 73 can be taken care of. For us, it's the other way around. Right? So if you're one of those 75, then the kind of attention, kind of mentorship, kind of help that you're going to get is minimal. So so it's you know it cuts both ways. It's going to be slightly more dumb capital, but if you know where you're heading, then maybe you know I'll just you know just get this money in the bank, raise quickly, and then come back to OBC in three to six months. Or you say, hey, I need significant help here. I might need some partnership. I might need some mentoring. Even if it you know means a hundred k, let me just go to OBC and get. Or let or even better, let's get a mix. I was just one uh, one other point. What would be the minimum valuation minimum uh, stake? We are massively flexible. So we invest anything between uh, half a million dollars to 50 million dollars. I, I personally hate it. I call it the complete lack of focus at Dustin. But you know, we are pretty much all over the place, and and you know that has a significant advantages for our portfolio companies because if you continue to do well, then we continue to pump in more capital. Right. But there is, we've taken five percent. We've taken 30 percent. I really so can't just, we are all over the place. One question. Uh, you said that you know the product has to be less, um, uh, you know, less complex and uh, the cost also has to be low. But when you are talking No, I am not saying that at all. Okay. <laughs> what I am saying is depending on the pricing and complexity of the product, your sales model will appear. Yes. But when you are talking about a B2B business typically. Yeah. It's obvious that you know the price would be high, uh -huh. and if the price is high, then there are complications as so well. So why would you say fresh desk is between price is not high? Okay. 
So, so as an investor, if you look at a B two B business, what is uh, the criteria for uh, you know, evaluating? That triangle. Okay. Uh, and is other than that, is there anything uh, out of it? Like Market size, quality of the entrepreneur, customer references. Are they loving the product? Are they using the product? Competition. Uh, how big can this get? What will be your pro profitability at scale? All these things matter. And uh, Ravi, what's so brilliant about customer referenceable customers you expect? Very hard to answer that. I mean, yeah, if it's depending on the checks, I mean, if it's you're selling for fifty dollars, then I would want to see upwards of let's say thousand, you know, okay. people using the product. If it's a hundred thousand, then obviously that number looks different. Then I want to see, uh, you know, how defensible is it, right? If you're selling something for a hundred thousand US dollars. Then you want to see, you know, uh, you know, what is he saying? Can he live without the product? How much time? What's your sales cycle? How many times do you have to go high hello and sell something worth hundred thousand? So, uh, give me some time. Maybe I can come back. You're looking at historical data. Is when I'm got excited, but no real answer off my head to be honest. Some significant traction in that business space. See, significant traction can be in multiple ways. Let's say you come back to me with five customers, and then you say, hey, I only have five customers. I did not spend it all. They all reached me. So marketing efficiency is crazy. Uh, retention, it's been six months, so I don't know retention. It's a software business, and contribution has to be high. Right? So two things figured out to some extent. Then on retention, we can debate how are they using it. Are they using it daily? Are they using it once a month? Are they using it once in six months? Or I call up the manager and say, boss, I can't live without this. If this goes off, I'll be, you know, it'll be terrible. Those are signals which point towards the fact that it's going to be there's going to be retention. We all live in a very uncertain world. Very, very uncertain world. Sure. Uh, I think I, we're running short of time. That's yeah. Okay, last question. <laughs> uh, so basically, if your model is something uh, like OLX or quicker, where you, uh, you, your user base matters more than the revenue, direct revenue. So in that case, I mean, marketing efficiency can be measured in terms of how many users you acquire through a marketing campaign. But how do you translate it to revenue then directly? I mean, As I said, you know, uh, when we funded Pinterest, we knew for the next four years there's going to be no revenue. Right. So how then uh, revenue retention and all those calculations come So I just answered that. It's going to be customer retention. Is customer continue to using it? Is he hooked? Is it a habit for him? Thanks. Yeah. All right.